right, so hi everyone. Um, welcome today to this uh, event, this talk hosted by the Psychoanalytic and Psychotherapeutic Facebook group, uh, which was founded by Mike. Uh, so today's event, we're going to be talking about the latest book, which has been co-edited by Derek Hook and Steen Van Hoel, if I'm getting that correct. Uh, and it's it's called Lacan, Lacan on Depression and Melancholia. So the subject matter is one I'm, I'm very interested in myself. I've been uh, really working in mental health since the early 2000s in London, in inner city London. And what, what, what our understanding of, of depression is so much based on the kind of cultural identification with being depressed is a, a, a kind of almost like a, a cultural signifier and, and, and that people identify with that very idea of being depressed. So the idea from a Lacanian perspective, I'm, I'm very interested to see what, uh, how Derek and Steen and Leon Brenner as well, how, how you elaborate the difference in a, in a Lacanian take. Uh, I'll just give a quick uh, introduction to our speakers today. So, first of all, we have Leon Brenner, who's going to kind of facilitate the conversation between Derek and Steen. And uh, Leon is author of a fantastic book uh, that it was offered by Leon last year, was the autistic subject uh, on the threshold of language. And this is a book I recommend to anybody interested in psychoanalysis specifically because it, it, it elaborates a, a, a new structure of, of for psychoanalysis, for Lacanian psychoanalysis in relationship to autism. Yeah? Now, to, to elaborate that difference, the distinction has to be made, first of all, between the three other structures. And that, that's, that's where one part of Leon's book is so good to just spell out the understanding of the different structures. So, you know, anybody interested in autism, fantastic book, but anybody interested in an introduction to Lacan and structure, I recommend, I recommend it on that level as well. Okay, so we also have, we have, uh, let me say, I quickly say that uh, Leon is a researcher, uh, research fellow at the Psychoanalytical University in Berlin, also at the Ruhr University and the Lotte Kohler Center as well. Derek, Derek Hook has been practicing, is a practicing psychoanalyst and he's an associate professor of Duquesne University. Co-editor and writer of another fantastic book that was uh, published last year, co-edited with Sheldon George, a uh, fantastic book on Lacan and race, which, which the group, the, the group here, we had discussions with Derek and Sheldon and a whole host of other writers for that as well. Uh, we've also got Steen Van Hill today, who's a practicing psychoanalyst and professor at Ghent University, author of many uh, publications as well, particularly in, in relationship to psychosis and also diagnosis and, and the DSM. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, hand over to Leon. Okay, thanks Edna. Hi Derek, nice, nice to see you again. Hey, last, Leon, time, you? last time we met it was really warm outside remember it was super hot here in berlin now it's yeah. Really, yeah, so, so come back, come back. <laughs> you know we're going to talk about this book edited by you too i have it here right here with me fantastic book and i'm saying this um being definitely impartial here right <laughs> um, so it's a, a, this book lacan on depression and melancholia I'll say a little bit about the book, Derek, because today I want to talk to you about the content of the book and particularly uh, your contribution to the book. So this means I don't want to spend so much time discussing what brought you to publish it or the fantastic um, image on the cover, which is also an interesting topic, but we'll not talk about that. So we'll get right into business. Okay, so I'll do a, a brief um sort of presentation of this book, which is extremely unique, um, I think, um, extremely unique in the fact that it develops a trans-structural approach to the experience of depression. So this means that it discusses how neurotic conflict can lead to depression, but also distinguishes between neurotic and psychotic forms of depression. I think this is where the book uh, is definitely new and excels. 
Um, so the book does that and it focuses on this notion of melancholia in Freud and Lacan. And doing that, it is also a fantastic introduction to their teaching. So those readers that are interested in learning more about the Auger Petit A, the big other, about desire, the super ego sublimation, um, this book is a great source for that. And what we see in the book is a sort of a rethinking of depression uh, while covering themes uh, in psychoanalysis uh, like mourning, commemoration, suicide, the death drive that we will talk about soon, creativity, mania, and more. And what is also so fantastic about this book is the fact that it has so many clinical case studies that demonstrates uh, the value of these concepts in psychoanalytic practice. So hmm, selling it quite well so far, there we go. So, okay. So, well, I think this book um, is, is really a, a great one that was published uh, recently. And basically, it's an invitation for those of you that want to pay more attention to the nuances of the contemporary experience of depression. And in this sense, it means Lacanians, so these would be scholars and practitioners, but also those that are interested in depression and are not necessarily practitioners or patients. So I think that covers it and we can get right into business. We can start talking about the themes in the book and we'll have about, Derek, we'll have about 15 minutes now and then we'll open up uh, to questions. I'm sure there'll be so many questions. Yes, but, so I'm not, I'm not worried about that at all. So I'll begin by just asking something, Derek, um, is something that you and me are, are kind of familiar with, but I'll ask it sort of from a perspective of a, of a, a no novice, of a layman. I'll ask you, um, well, you know, um, depression is not a central concept in Lacanian uh, psychoanalysis. And in fact, it is critiqued and even distrusted uh, by many Lacanian analysts. So my first question is, why? Why, why is depression perceived in this way uh, in the uh, Lacanian orientation? I mean, that's, that's a great question, Leon, and thank you for beginning with that question, because in some respects, that's also the beginning of the book. Um, I had a project and I started noticing that lots of Lacanian authors are uh, highly critical of this concept of depression. And you could say, what's up with that, right? I mean, if there's one... Um, uh, concept that seems, in terms of so-called mental health issues, that seems uh, predominant, um, both in popular culture, and I think that's important. We're also thinking about uh, depression as a popular discourse that we utilize every day, many different ways. And in the world of psychotherapy, psychiatry, it's hard to find a word that is more frequently deployed in a loosely descriptive way than depression. And of course, when we look at some of the indices of what is considered to be the predominant area of mental suffering across the world, you'll often hear about depression. So we have a bit of a conundrum. Lacanians want to have a whole lot of critical things to say about something that, that for many of us seems to be an absolutely necessary descriptive term. So if we had to take a first step, we could say, well, why then? Where, where does all this critique come from? And what is the nature of the critique? And, and a first, a first um, pass at that problem would be able to, to yield something that's not all that controversial. And that's the idea that for many Lacanian practitioners, the concept of depression is under differentiated, right? It's, it's, it's kind of somewhat amorphous. It seems to mean many different types of things. So that's the first step. But another crucial element, and here we're kind of taking a deeper, um, we're jumping right in, as it were, to, to use your phrase from earlier, is, uh, is to say that when we talk about depression, we're often indicating an affective state, okay, fairly obviously, but for many Lacanians, that's not the most precise way to say something particular and clinically useful about a particular type of suffering. And maybe we can we can move a little bit more quickly here. One of the abiding concerns in the early chapters in the book is to say that if we're using properly psychoanalytic terms, and I'm also aware that not everyone in attendance today is, you know, particularly Lacanian, which is absolutely great, actually. Um, I think we, we we sometimes find in Lacanian circles a sense of is this a properly Freudian or psychoanalytic concept? And looking back on the book, I think what it tries to do is to deploy a series of psychoanalytic concepts, some of which are more Lacanian, some of which are Freudian, to think about both depression and melancholia and to give us more precise tools 
to be able to ascertain the nature of the suffering and how one should go about as a clinician trying to alleviate and facilitate some kind of you know improvement from those states of suffering mm -hmm. so one crucial move here particularly when we're talking about neurotic level depressive suffering is to say that instead of always focusing merely at the level of affect which is intuitive which is a thing we're called upon to do which which seems the most basic orientation I think for many of us, we're called upon affect, it's, it's visible, it's there in the clinic, it seems to be something that's most real about the subject, is to always ask, well, what underlies the affect, and maybe to be more attuned, particularly in the domain of neurosis, to what are the conflicts, the repressive elements of a subject's history, which may then give be given voice symptomatically in depression. I'll just say two more things. Mm -hmm. Part of the Lacanian critique of depression then is not only that it's amorphous and that it's not differentiated enough, or to put that in different terms, you could say it's not structural. It's a basic descriptive category, which isn't precise enough. And of course, as I've just said, depression seems to imply the way we use the term that we should focus on affective states at the cost of attending also to what is the, the structural and conflictual uh, economies underlying those. But we have two further problems with, with the contemporary language of depression. Number one, it is very close to medicalizing and biologizing um, what we would think of, of as certain forms of suffering, because one of the first steps one takes in response to thinking about depression is, what should I take? What, what meds would necessarily help me alleviate this form of suffering, mm -hmm. which for many clinical practitioners is is okay, perhaps, but you would have to say from a Lacanian perspective, it's important to be able to put into speech, to be able to speak, to be able to find an ethical, as it were, um, task of exploring the unconscious, of exploring one's subjectivity, rather than simply or in, in association with taking some kind of meds to alleviate the problem. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So there is within the Lacanian critique an awareness of what might be problematic about simply medicalizing and biologizing psychological suffering. And I think many of us would resonate um, with that critique. Uh, and furthermore, uh, uh, a further uh, critical dimension here is you could say, um, and I, I, I find this argument in, in a number of, of colleagues' work, um, you see it in Bruce Fink, you see it in, in Darren Leader and other colleagues, that there's almost something iatrogenic in the discourse of depression. Why? Well, depression becomes something that I need to take care of via this kind of treatment and that kind of treatment, or more particularly, it is something that needs to be dealt with in a way that bypasses my own ethical responsibility to talk, to explore, to work with it clinically. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, often the way that depression works as a cultural narrative, as a medicalized cultural narrative, is, is is something which is in itself problematic. It, it, it's, it engenders a certain kind of um, pathologizing, you could say. Um, so let me pause there because I'm, I'm guessing that that's prompted a question or two. Um, but just to say then, I hope what that's done is give a little bit of texture to why Lacanians would be critical of the concept of depression. And maybe just to qualify all of that, the idea then I think would not be to throw out the baby with the bathwater and say there's no such thing as depression, but mm -hmm. to qualify. Do we mean depression in a way that links to underlying conflicts? Do we mean depression as the result of, an, of ambivalence that is not voiced? Do we mean depression as a result of a kind of aggressivity that cannot be voiced and which thus becomes turned within? Um, there are other concepts that we would want to utilize to think about what, what at a surface appearance presents as depression, but may also be thought of and, and analytically engaged at a different level of conceptualization. Yes, absolutely. And I want to, I definitely want to get there to this distinction, but maybe we can start um, with, with this more, let's say, um, general like perception that, that you, is presented in the uh, beginning of the book, where, and I think Edna has mentioned this just recently, where, where um, depression has become, as you say, a master signifier that refers to a contemporary discontent with civilization. And here um, you refer in the text to Freud's civilization and its discontent. 
um, as uh, sort of the, 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 the cause, the manufacturing cause of, of this, uh, let's say, wider, or as, as you say, master signifier that refers to this experience. And I, I want maybe for you to, to shed a little more light on this idea, on this understanding of depression as an outcome of so socialization in this way. Can you give me a little bit more on that, Leon? Um, in other words, we're, we're, we're kind of thinking more societal or sociological account of depression and its shortcomings from a Lacanian perspective? Well, I mean, th this is this is a certain idea, the, the idea that depression today as a wide term that describes a variety of different phenomena uh, is, in fact, what we might associate with the subject's discontent with society. Right. OK. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this may not be a direct answer to, to what you're um, asking, but one of the intriguing ways of thinking about that comes right at the end of Stephanie Swales's chapter. It's, it's the first full chapter in the book, and um, she does a great job, actually, of talking about all the different dimensions of neurotic conflict which may manifest in depressive symptomatology and, and, and you know, kind of making much the same arguments that I was just making which is much indebted to her actually, um, about how one should look at you know, underlying components of aggression, ambivalence and so on. Um, but one way of thinking about the argument that you've made is, <clears throat> let's say two things. Um, one is to say that, and this is part of the argument she makes at the end of her chapter, is sometimes depression might be linked to a denial of desire in, this, in the life of the subject. And sometimes we also have, maybe if we could put it in these terms, depression as it relates to capitalist discourse. And um, one of the things, in fact, I might see if I can even quote how she, she puts it. Uh, oh, here we go. I got it. I got it. She says, contemporary depression is often related to the denial of loss and of lack and the consequent abdication of the path of desire that is produced in reproductive capitalists. And um, she says some interesting things about that. But you could say one of the, the discourses in contemporary society is enjoy yourself, almost like you have this duty to enjoy. And in the inability to fulfill that mandate, you could say part of what starts to be generated is the subject's own sense of being less than, than worthwhile. Um, so it's interesting to to also, and she gives another example, like in, in many terms, um, you could say, well, what is it that gives me value? What is it that gives me value in the sense of how others might see me and in terms of the symbolic order in which I live? And sometimes that is um, a question of certain degree of uh, material wealth or material achievements. Um, and I suppose what she's arguing there is to, to fall into that pattern is also a pattern of one which will necessarily mean that um, one's actual desire gets pushed to one side and one starts to locate oneself relative to those um, signifiers of achievement, which in, to me sounds like a, a, a blueprint of a, a depressive situation. Mm -hmm. um, the other issue that I think is of interest, and this is an argument that, that Darren Leader makes earlier on, mm -hmm. he does something which is unusually, I suppose, um, sociological, actually, for, for a, a, a clinician, a Lacanian clinician. But he, he wants to argue that the discourse of depression engenders certain social norms that, that folks may fail to live up to. And if that's the case, if the discourse of depression is going to create this sense that one has failed in certain um, apparent benchmarks of a productive, healthy, achieving life, then the discourse of depression is itself, as I've been trying to suggest a little bit earlier on, iatrogenic. In other words, it, it, it's part of the problem, the discourse of depression, not merely the sentiments, the affects, the, the, um, the emotional maladies of the subject. So I suppose those are two maybe somewhat undeveloped answers, but thinking about both the discourse of depression itself as being problematic in terms of further causing suffering when people feel that they're not attaining the ideals that are expected of them in society, and also thinking a little bit about um, the dynamics and the discourse of capitalism in terms of the, the engendering of, of depression. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, um, there is this, um, this quote from uh, uh, Lacan that speaks about um, uh, let's say um, the, uh, the the fact that um, 
I'm trying to to find it, but I'm not. But the idea that when when let's I'll try and paraphrase it. Then the idea that the the understanding on of one's theory and the capacity to conceptualize directly affects uh, one's praxis. Yes, and in this sense, there is a sort of an ethical imperative to uh, engage with these. Um, let's say, umbrella concepts, uh, uh, which are affected by many, many different factors, uh, as you've mentioned right now, and uh, not only factors that appear in the clinical setting. And I'll, I'll uh, yeah, there. Well, I mean, just to say, I mean, it, it's worthwhile hi highlighting something that Lacan does, which is fairly scandalous, okay? Uh, and, and I mean, it's, it's in the introduction to the book, Stephanie Swales' chapter engages with it as well, but there's this moment in a televised interview television is a book it's published and, and Lacan does this thing which is very Lacanian right to be provocative and outlandish and and comes out and says you know uh, depression is a moral failing yes. and um, that, that has a funny resonance with the kinds of arguments that I've just made in mm -hmm. fact it sounds like it's making the same problems of what I've just made mm -hmm. so I think it's necessary to think a little bit about why he would say that and what its performative effect and what its implications are so yes. number one, let's know. Oh, Derek, let me quote that in full. Let me okay. quote that one yeah, in full. Yeah, I really wanted to discuss this and it would be fantastic. Uh, so uh, again, this is, as you said, from this in television interview called Television. This is uh, very nice. And this is the quote in full. And Derek, you go right, right at it after. So I'll, I'll say, Lacan is saying, uh, we qualify sadness as depression because we give it soul for support. But it isn't a state of the soul. It is simply a moral failing, as Dante and even Spinoza said, a sin, which means a moral weakness, which is ultimately located only in relation to thought, that is, in the duty to be well spoken, to find one's way in dealing with the unconscious. Yeah, it's one of those days you wake up one morning and think, why do I have to try and, you know, defend this kind of statement? It gives me a headache. <laughs> you, like, on, you could have made life a lot easier. But anyways, all right, so here's an attempt. Yeah, let's give it a one, shot. Number one, let, let's bear in mind, you know, here's someone who, who likes being provocative, um, which indeed is, you know, a good psychoanalytic standpoint, actually, to provoke something. Um, and number two, what's kind of fascinating about it before we engage with the content as such is this, this as it were, uh, conceptual and historical move where one unabashedly says, I'm not engaging, if one is like on at the time, I'm not engaging with the, the social scientists, the psychiatrists of, and, my, and the psychologists of the time, but rather I'm going to do a little bit of reading of Spinoza and theologians and a whole much older historical and theological tradition of thinking about some of these issues. So that's kind of interesting, and that's also indicative of a first crucial move to change the ground of explanation and, and conceptualization from that of social science and, and, and you know, human science psychiatry to theo theology and, and, and an, an older philosophical tradition immediately foregrounds the dimension of ethics. Now, what do we mean by ethics here? And I think one of the dimensions of ethics here is the idea that ethics within the clinical domain of psychoanalysis involves you could say without using the word maybe in a harsher sense maybe it's too strong the responsibility to speak the responsibility not simply actually just to speak but to enunciate to explore to subject one's own life and those facets of one's life that are not necessarily uh, abundantly apparent or consciously apparent to speech to a kind of speech investigation in the context of someone else. In other words, in a transference context where someone will speak and be able to hear some of the rebounded effects of their words as spoken to another. So there's a variety of different subcomponents that, that come in the, the, the moral failing. Number one, I've mentioned the ethical thing. Number two, if we keep in mind that it is also occurring within a theological context, the duty to speak implies the duty to speak within reference of a symbolic order or in reference to a god, which is another way of echoing something about a transference context. Mm -hmm. But I think at the at the bottom line of that, if we were to try and try to defend this scandalous statement, 
what Lacan is saying, and bear in mind that in a kind of welfare system where there is an idea that if you are suffering, you hear your meds, this is what you need to do, you don't need to speak about it, we'll find you a quick fix solution, and the problem is not something that you need to speak about at length in, in therapy, for example. Um, or, you know, very delimited short amounts of time. Um, and I mean, basically, we're talking about how depression has become a psychiatric uh, medicalized uh, issue. But to cut to the chase, what I think we can do with that scandalous statement is to say what I think Lacan is trying to gesture towards and, 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 and quite, you know, provocatively assert is the need to subject um, depressive suffering to the subject's responsibility to speak, to explore facets of their life in a transference context, which interestingly, now that we talk about it, needn't only be clinical psychoanalysis, but I mean, maybe that's another discussion. Mm. Um, and also to do something with the well-spoken that you referred to, the enunciative prospect of thinking about what parts of their life are unconscious and what might be some of the conflicts that, that underlie that. So that's my best attempt. Uh, Leon, you, you may have a, an additional thought or two, but I think that's one way of, of trying to contextualize the, the statement. But for me, it's also useful, and this is what we do in the introduction, we try to contextualize that statement and utilize it, depression as a moral failing, not simply with reference to all the stuff I've just said about an individual's duty to speak, but in reference to how the discourse of depression becomes a kind of moral failing, a problem for, for, for clinical work more generally, in as much as that discourse is one because of its medicalization, how it's been subjected to a kind of psychiatric medicalization, um, plays its part, you could argue, actually, in, in trying to bypass this, the, the talking therapies. Phew. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, it's very common to receive um, uh, an analysis and, uh, or a person that wants to treat this, this, this uh, depressive experience, the depressive suffering, but then in a way refuses to speak. This is something that's quite common today where people ask, well, I know what's wrong, fix it. Hmm? Uh, and this is, the, the, I think Stain speaks about it in, in his paper and when he's here, I'll address a direct question about that to him. Um, I have some some personal ones for you, Derek, as well. Uh, but let, let's let's move. Let's take another step to keep people on their on their toes. Uh, getting um, into so some... can I, can I just uh, interject momentarily? Uh, I, I was uh, I was wondering if Derek, are you Leon? If you, if you have anything to say about the idea of guilt here, the idea of guilt, and it's talking about Lacan and some controversial thing he might say, say the idea that the only thing you can be guilty of is, is giving up on your own desire. So if we think about the moral failure, maybe in two kind of, two in two senses, that in relationship to depression, there's this, the suffering, the symptom of the individual, the subject, and then there's the discourse around it. Yeah? So we can say there's a, a moral failing in, in both. In, in relationship to this idea of giving up on, on desire, did, did, could you say anything about guilt, the idea of guilt, how, how, how that would play out in, in, in both ideas? Yeah? Just Lacan's specific idea of guilt has been that giving up on, on desire. Yeah? Sorry, that's a bit tricky of a question. <laughs> Well, I'll say two things quickly. One is, um, I, I've alluded to Stephanie Swales' opening chapter a couple of times, and one of the things she does there is 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 to, to make a very Freudian move, and that's to say that when there's repression, what that might mean is a whole series of displacements and, you know, symbolic operations. Um, but what happens in, in repression as well is often an attenuation of, of an affect. Um, or transformation of an affect. Now, as clinicians, you know, we, we would know that, that often one finds, you know, free floating forms of anxiety, which are seemingly difficult to, to locate and understand, but through a certain amount of work, one can find some, um, how that state is more diffused and attenuated um, corollary of some other affect, which is, which is not necessarily being stated overtly, as it were. Um, and I think you could say that what one finds in depression, I mean, I, I found her chapter very useful because I would often see that link. Like I see 
I see anxiety, and then with a little bit of work, anxiety yeah. can be located and, and, and connected to a different series of affects. But you could say that depression as a kind of smothering affect is also related to how subjects in a way fail, for example, to express aggressivity or fail or, or, or try to repress a whole series of ambivalent feelings. And in some respects also how one tries to, as it were, smother or deal with with effects of guilt. So that that for me was kind of useful because one, you know, like depression is something, you know, presumably most of us can relate to at some descriptive level. But when we start to think about depression as a mode of attenuated smothering affect for a form of affect, which might be related to a whole series of far less pleasant and problematic uh, uh, affects, I think then we start to, to, to unearth some of the dynamism um, that not only comes with repression, well, with repression, but with, with certain affects which no longer seem to be socially acceptable. And, and one of them is, I mean, without going on too much of a tangent, is, you know, sometimes in, in supervision and also with um, uh, some of the, the, the clinical students that I work with, one of my questions is, what, what do we do with aggression today? You know, if you're in a kind of progressive, whatever liberal environment, we're all very uncomfortable with feeling massively aggressive about someone. But again, as clinicians will know, it's not like that's gone away. Um, so, so depression, you could say, is almost maybe the culturally normative, almost you could say to be a little bit provocative, encouraged affective modality that at some level we prefer to, to outward um, uninhibited expressions of aggressivity and maybe guilt too. The other thing I would say about that is, you know, that 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 famous comment from Seminar Seven is the only the only uh, reason that the whatever gives the subject is guilty of giving ground on way of on matters of their desire, is that I think it also is of course an ethical maxim, yeah. which you know lots of people have different readings about it. But what I was trying to say earlier in terms of how one could give a kind of delimited and specific definition of what is the ethical here, the ethical here for me at least pertains to questions of of, of a clinical treatment. And if one has, it, it's, a, it's one of the examples in Stephanie Swales' chapter, if one has lived a life or a, a recent life where one is constantly given way on certain forms of desire, um, presumably that does allow for a variety of psychical effects, one of which is guilt. And as we've just seen, guilt itself can be, as it were, treated with depressive symptomatology. So I hope that goes some way. I mean, I'm curious also, actually, Leon, I'm sure you'll have some thoughts on, on that. Um, did, you, did you have any thoughts that you wanted to add to uh, Ender's uh, well, question? Maybe we can take uh, take hold of them later on in the discussion section um, and sort of have these yeah. more particular ones. So thanks, Edna, for, for interjecting. Um, but let's... Uh, Derek, I really want to take take the the the, the listeners um, one step further into the Lacanian framework and sort of understanding of the experience of depression. The book makes this uh, distinction that is very important, I think, between depression first as a non psychoanalytic con a concept, then the the experience of depression in neurosis, and then melancholia, which is determined as a substructure of psychosis. And I think this would maybe surprise some of the listeners to, to think of depression in this sense. So I wanted to sort of open this up uh, right now and ask you what, what is in fact uh, the difference between uh, depression, the experience of depression in neurosis and melancholia? And how do I really understand it then as, a, as an experience of neurosis versus a modality of psychosis? Yeah, that's that's fundamental, and I'm I'm happy that we're able to talk about that because in some respects, although we wanted to do the the critique of depression thing, in some respects, the the topic of melancholia was was even more formative in, in thinking about um about the book. Yeah. Um. Now, a couple of things. Number one, I think you're absolutely right. If we can spend a little bit of time saying, well, what is it about melancholia that is so that is so important for Lacanians, and why would Lacanians seek to locate what they call melancholia within the the structure of psychosis so that we should spend a little bit of time on right. let's take let's take a moment to note first off some people will know this but what lacanians for, refer to as psychotic structure is not what many folks would think about as um uh noisy schizophrenic hallucinatory um psychosis 
Mm -hmm. um, of course, schizophrenic hallucinatory psychosis fits within the structure of, of, of psychosis. But let's say for Lacanians, the structure of psychosis is bigger than that. Traditionally, you could say that it typically is made up of paranoia as one kind of substructure, um, schizophrenia and, and, and melancholia, you know, and there's, of course, debates about, you know, what, what other forms we'd put in there. But uh, psychotic structure for Lacanians is a kind of mode of being in the world where foreclosure is the predominant mechanism of denial and defense rather than repression. And I just want to keep that in place, because if we take that seriously, that means that you can be psychotically structured, you can be stable, you can function in the world, but you're not using predominantly repression you know, the amnesia, the displacements, all of those things that we are most familiar with in, in, in kind of classic Freudian analysis. So weirdly, that also means you can be psychotically structured and not particularly symptomatic, okay? You can be psychotically structured and live a life that doesn't seem to necessarily be uh, characterized by hallucinations, delusions, and all of that stuff. So just to do that little bit of heavy lifting first. Um, now, what that then means is, presumably in the Kenyan discourse, there's a big difference between psychotic structure per se and psychotic structure post a triggering. Mm -hmm. There's lots of interesting things to say about elementary phenomena, what happens in the triggering of a psychosis, and then the advent of more overtly uh, psychotic symptomatology. But just to keep that as an as, as a, um, opening move. So then the question comes, when Freud talks about melancholia in such evocative and, and useful ways, and I mentioned earlier, you know, sometime one of the agendas of the book is instead of just using this loose vocabulary of, of depression, what is the properly Freudian or psychoanalytic concepts with which to approach something? When Freud articulates what melancholia is, he's talking about something precise. He's giving it a, a, a dynamism. He's giving it a conceptual texture and uh, a refinement, which I think is very useful to clinicians, even though there's lots of debates about what are the shortcomings of the paper and how to use it. But the question then emerges for us, um, why should it be within the domain of psychotic structure for Lacanians? Yeah. And let me add once again, one can be melancholic or what maybe other folks would think of as, as a kind of psychotic depression or very severe form of depression. One can be melancholic without having hallucinations, delusions, and so on and so forth. So we could say that melancholia as fitting within the broader domain of psychotic structure doesn't necessarily sound like or feel like something like schizophrenia, just to belabor the obvious. But again, the question returns, why should it be within the domain of psychotic structure? Mm -hmm. We can give a bunch of reasons for that, but let's start with a kind of Freudian notion and a Freudian idea. Freud will say, as we're all familiar, that when we're dealing with melancholia, we're dealing with something where the subject will outwardly berate themselves for their own worthlessness. They'll do so in very loud, as it were, clamorous terms, and they will not be convinced otherwise. So our first little dipping our toe in the water as way of response to this answer would be to say that there's certainty. There's certainty of the subject's own worthlessness. And it's not the same as the neurotic subject arriving, uh, lamenting how stupid they are, how worthless they are, with the secret hope that maybe you will say something to the contrary. Mm -hmm. This has a different level of certainty. Mm -hmm. So although I've said that melancholia is not necessarily psychotic in the same or psychotically structured in the same way that like overt schizophrenia would be, there is something about that certainty and the undialectical by which it's a fancy Lacanian term, I've been practicing in the mirror, sorry. Uh, the fact that that cannot be shifted, that certainty that it will not be shifted or mediated or moderated, that tells us something. In very basic Lacanian terms, when we have that degree of certainty, we start to say that doesn't sound very neurotic because neurotic is all about vacillation. I'm not sure, maybe, could be, possibly. Mm -hmm. So there's something of that. We won't say delusory, but there's something about that absolute conviction of worthlessness which stands out. So that's one way of thinking about why potentially melancholy may fit within the broader domain of psychotic structure. But there's also some other reasons. And here's a, a nice concept, a nice opportunity to introduce both the Lacanian concept and to see how it reverberates across some chapters in the book, and hopefully to also answer your question. So one of the big Lacanian concepts in thinking about desire and thinking about neurosis and thinking about psychosis is the notion of object A, this, this missing thing, this extracted thing, this thing that's not there, which uh, in its very instantiation of lack 
brings about desire. Okay, and of course, you know, in, in everyday terms, one could think about how one's object A is particular to one, and it's a thing that animates the desirousness of a given object. The Lacanian idea being that object A, despite being called object A, thanks Lacan for confusing my day further, is not an object, but it is that thing which makes, invests an object with a certain desirousness or lackingness. Mm -hmm. Now, within the domain of neurosis, there's something that's been subtracted, right? I want more, I wish I could get this, or the thing that motivates my desire is not then I'm always trying to get it. So object A here is in neurosis is related to desire and an extraction, a loss. And there's lots of ways of thinking about what that loss might be. But what if we presented with someone in the clinic for whom that thing's not there, but what is there is an excess, an excess property, as something that's too muchness. Now, we could think in very categorical and very basic terms about the Lacanian concept of jouissance, libidinal enjoyment, libidinal intensities, and how neurotic subjects complain about not having enough of it. And why does someone else have it? And why can't I get more of it? Very neurotic sounding level of complaints. But we also get subjects who present in psychoanalysis for whom that's not as much of a problem as the excess, the too muchness whether it is the too muchness of persecutory delusions, whether it is the too muchness of the body's inflammations and agitations, or whether it is the too muchness of some kind of burning present object. And so what I'm trying to do then is say that that notion of object A, the, the lack, the desirousness that animates, and in some respects, uh, yeah, animates the desire of the neurotic, takes on a very different form in psychosis, where now object A is a too muchness, an excess thing, a burning object that comes too close and causes a great deal of anxiety and difficulty. So that sounds a little bit like um, a distinction between neurosis and psychosis, but what we then start to find is some nice descriptions from clinicians who are writing chapters in the book about when they talk about particular cases of melancholia, one of the distinguishing features of melancholia is that there's this excess of object A. It's, I think it's in your chapter, Leon, it's in um, Russell Griggs chapter, it's in the very nice chapter from Jamison Webster and Patricia Jerovici, and it also features a little bit in my own chapter. Mm -hmm. So maybe just take a pause there to get another a question from you, but just to say that's one way of, of thinking about it. That's a little abstract, so we might want to give some examples. And I don't want to overload the theory here, but of course, the other major distinction, which does appear in your chapter, actually, Leon, is where repressive dynamics are what underlies neurosis, it's a foreclosure of sorts, which underlies psychotic structure. And if melancholia is within psychotic structure, we would expect to find some elements of foreclosure. So those, that begs two rather big questions. Well, what would foreclosure look like in melancholia and what would object A look like in foreclosure? But let me just see if you've got a question or a thought or a contribution before I, before I try to think about that. Let's go right bit. to it then. Well, I mean, you've mentioned Russell Griggs chapter and he has this beautiful uh, illustration there with the skull, right? Uh, with kissing the beautiful face that turns immediately into the underlying skull as a very illustrative example. Uh, but uh, I, I let, let's focus on, on, on your contribution to the book, on, on the chapter you wrote that's called The Complex of Melancholia. It's a very dense and fantastic chapter. It's one of my favorite chapters in the book, I have to say. And you, know, you, you go there and you um, explain, um, uh, um, you go and delve into the notion of the death drive. Clearly, that has to do with depression, with melancholia, because um, you know, some patients, they commit suicide. Death has something to do uh, with their experience. And you suggest, we, you, you suggest we look at it a different way. And in this sense, you suggest a different understanding of the death drive, uh, not something on the line of a suicidal impetus, but, or a yearning for a physical death, but a struggle against the limit, limiting boundaries of the symbolic order. Right? And you say that it is not the secession of life, but it's the insistence beyond the bounds and limits of practicality, social norms, and everyday comfort and expectation. And this is what you identify as the presence of the death drive in melancholia. And 
I, I was reading this and I was saying, oh, oh Derek, you're actually describing a, a, certain, a certain singular rendition of, the, of Heidegger's being towards death. And you illustrate it with a movie that I really like, uh, a movie called Into the Wild, which is a really good movie based on a book. And you do it quite, quite beautifully. So I wanted you to tell us then, what is the unique relationship that the melancholic has with the death drive? Uh, or as you state in your book, and you also refer to Russell Grigg, the unique relationship with object A that we see in melancholia. Yeah. Okay. So one way of doing that is is to refer back actual to back actually to some of Russell Grigg's work, and 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 Grigg makes the argument that wait a minute, let's think about melancholia. Is melancholia simply to be understood in 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 Freudian terms as the the loss of a once loved now hated object that is now as it were internalized and such that the hate and aggression toward that lost object is now internalized and played out with onto the ego itself. Mm -hmm. and, and bearing in mind, for me, what is one of those great Freud quotes, which animates a lot of my chapter, actually, is that within um, what, what we see in melancholia is the pure instinct of the death drive. It's, mm -hmm. it's a great quote, and I think it kind of links to some of the things we've been saying. So, so there's this idea that for Russell Grigg, what one would look for, and I'm recapitulating some of what we just said about object A, is what one would look for is the burning a traumatic presence of an object which is too close, which has a toxic uh, burning quality that cannot be, as it were, metabolized, that is not easily mediated with the, the, the structures of language and, and so on, operations of language and so on. So let's keep that theme in mind. And then I'll say something about the chapter. The, the chapter for me was really um, interesting and really motivated by a piece of clinical um, experience. And that was by um, listening to someone talk at length about um, a lot of very, very detailed, well-planned suicidal strategies. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this was uh, as a trainee and, you know, uh, it's a little disconcerting at the time. Um, but, and I mean, I don't know, maybe people here have had that, that kind of experience before. So it's not just one scenario that's articulated, but a series of very well-developed, well-researched scenarios. <laughs> So much so that in the telling, one gets a sense both that this is not a passing element in, in, a, in a person's life, but it is kind of the fundamental thread that runs through their everyday existence, right? So what does that mean? What is it like when, when one is um, working with someone for whom reveries of death, reveries of ending their own life is a constant abiding preoccupation of everyday existence? So that's a, that's, that's a little um, grounding in, in the clinical realm, but we could also now say to do it more conceptually, that sounds a little bit like, and in fact, I think is the same as what it would mean to make an identification with the place of the dead and an identification in the properly psychoanalytic sense, not an identification like I like you, I'm a bit like you, I identify with you, a fundamental structural identification with the place of the dead. So there's a piece of clinical work, which is a little bit alarming. And there immediately one starts to, to see that idea. Let's use that as a little mantra, okay? Melancholia is a radical identification with being dead already, or wanting to be dead, and to take that idea seriously. And I think when we take that idea seriously, it also reverberates with the question we've been debating. Well, why should this be psychotic structure? Mm -hmm. To be radically, fundamentally identified with the dead that doesn't sound very neurotic, right? Mm. But nevertheless, so that was that was what was part of what motivated it. But then comes the second step. And the second step is to realize that in part of the clinical work, there was something consoling and helpful for the subject to discuss, to elaborate, to articulate multiple ideas of their own death. And um, and that was, that was also a little startling because what one starts to realize is, well, a bunch of things. That in everyday life, if that is how you're experiencing things, it's very difficult to express that to your friends and colleagues that you are constantly preoccupied with the, the hope to end your own life and no longer exist. And not just that, but not to simply to bring your life to an end, but to live, uh, to bring the fact of your ever having lived to an end which takes it to another level, right? I mean, for me, that's, that's more Lacanian death drive is not simply to end a, a one biological organic life, but to erase the fact that one ever existed. Mm 
and that that's that's we can do some stuff with that like the marquis de sardes apparently i don't know how apocryphal this is or not wish that when he dies that there's no marker there's no gravestone that all his possessions are burnt that he's simply put into the earth and, and a little meadow grows over it um whatever so this radical effacement of even ever having existed mm -hmm. but then the idea that that maybe there's something consoling in this and what then starts to become interesting is to ask in the clinical work with someone who's melancholic how is one able to support the work of one who is already living the life of someone who is dead. There might be many ways of trying to give that, give that experience words. There's many, as it were, uh, genres or ways of trying to, to, to locate oneself in that domain. But I suppose the paradox is how one enables one to uh, another person or helps in the work, the clinical work, someone to continue being or articulate the experience of being dead so as to continue to to live um anyway so that's that's a little motivation for how the chapter came about but then what i found very interesting was um to watch into the wild the christopher McCandless story which is also a book and let me add the caveat immediately i am not in obviously in a position to say anything diagnostically viable about christopher McCandless. i've just seen the film and read the book and, and read a couple of books about him but what starts to become apparent in, in, in his life and in the retelling of it is that this is someone for whom a certain symbolic position becomes very difficult to maintain, not just because he's a re rebel or a romantic soul who wants to be out in the wilderness, but because there's something fundamentally suffering about being located in a certain symbolic place. And so his genre, his way of dealing with this thing is to go into the wild. And what that enables him to do, I would argue, and I think even if it's not a literally applicable mode of description, it helps us think about what clinical work with melancholic subjects can do. Find a way of living a life and expressing a life, which is whether it's off grid or whether it, it enables one to take a position outside of the constraints of a symbolic location and identity um, that enables a completely different way of living. Um, I could say more about that. It's a topic that I get all excited about, but I see stains here. So let's let's maybe bring that one, um, bring that to a, to a conclusion. Um, but oh, maybe just to, just two more things about that. It, it, what was interesting, both in the clinical case that I worked with and within the Christopher McCandless thing, is sometimes death drive manifests not simply as the wish to bring one's own life to an end, and indeed, of course, it can manifest in that way, but also it manifests in a sense of not wanting to be located or finding it impossible to be located in the symbolic order as such, and one needs to find a modality of, of existence that is somehow a little bit outside of that. And part of that also seems to link to me to a theme in, in Genevieve Morel's chapter. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose I'm about to start a whole new topic, so I should be quiet. But where she talks about um, Susan Stern, this American revolutionary who, um, who has a series of reveries of death. So it's not just being able to locate oneself outside of the social order. It's also to be able to locate oneself with the reality of death drive. But a little bit of another topic let, let's let me pause <laughs> so I, I i definitely identify this thread in your in your paper um derek and actually i i was seeing something that might be a bit contradictory in one of of stain's paper in the book but before we get everyone uh fighting and 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 uh, <laughs> arguing uh, Stain, welcome. Really great you're joining us. Uh, we we can continue straight straight with you. Uh, segue segue into your your work in the paper uh, because we're speaking about this distinction between a melancholia which uh, is structured uh, as a psychosis and then the experience of of depression in neurosis. And I want to ask you a question about the transference, um, because, well, what, what we know or how we, we approach this question, uh, and Derek was mentioning the foreclosure of the name of the father, we'll just call it foreclosure, as something that, uh, that, that makes the, the, the situating of the analyst uh, in the transference difficult. Uh, because many times the analyst has experiment, experienced as persecutory, as tormenting, and this even risks the triggering of, of a, a psychotic break. Uh, 
And this is why the handling of transparency in neurosis is very different than the way it is handled uh, in psychosis, up to a point where Freud says that it might be impossible even to handle it uh, in psychosis. Now, Lacan doesn't agree. And I think, Stein, you wrote a lot about that. Uh, but Lacan doesn't elaborate so much on the transference in psychosis. And he even says that he doesn't, he doesn't want to go beyond Freud. So he's not going to tell us. He does describe something particular in his reading of Schreber, something that he, he says uh, that transference might manifest as a mortifying erotomania. And we have a certain clue, which is developed in the book by several uh, of the, of the uh, writers. But particularly, Stein, I want to ask about your paper, Maneuvers of Transference in Psychosis, where you explicitly discuss supporting the transference in psychotic me melancholia. And in this sense, in comparison to other Lacanian scholars that do discuss transference in psychosis in terms of what not to do, uh, using this case study that you present in the chapter, you provide a positivistic account of such a work. And, you know, in this sense, you, you in a way, go uh, beyond, beyond Lacan with Lacan. Hmm? And I wanted to, you to maybe tell us a little bit, what is the transference in melancholia then? And if you could also tell us a little bit um, about this particular analytic position that you describe in the paper. Yeah, uh, thank you, Leon, and also for your patience in, 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 in waiting for me. <laughs> um, now, I think the main difference that needs to be made um, in between neurotic depression and psychotic melancholia is that neurotic depression will always start from some experience of deception. A person feels deceived by the other. Um, and therefore, when, 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 when someone with a neurotic depression enters therapy, it will always be difficult because there is a certain kind of hesitation towards the analyst. So at the one hand, there is a search for help, but on the other hand, there is this other idea that probably the other won't be of any help. So therefore, and let me accentuate this first, that in, in the case of neurotic depression, I think something of a move by the analyst is needed. And it has to be a move where the analyst presents him or herself as, as another who is available, as another who is there at the level of the well ethics of the well-spoken, because if depression as, as a sin against the ethics of the of the well spoken, um, meaning that the not saying of something is bringing a person down. Then the analyst has to be at the position of finding a way in again into into the other into the other of speech and of truth. Um, there is a certain timeout at the level of depression, so that needs active work. Um, so th that's my first part of my answer. Uh, it's deception is the, is the central thing that characterizes neurotic depression. And um, at the level of, of, of the psychotic melancholia, I would rather than say that, of course, as an effect of the foreclosure of the name of the father, there is a disorientation. Uh, there is a disorientation uh, in relation to the other, meaning that the other might just as well obtain threatening characteristics um, or the other might obtain, uh, as you said, the erotomanic qualities like someone who is sexually or romantically interested in me, or it might also clearly obtain this melancholic characteristic, meaning the other will be the witness of my decay because this is often what is the case in a, in, a, in, in a melancholic depression. There is the analysant will present his or her suffering to the analyst and it will go down. It will go down and the analyst will be in the powerless position of the one who is gradually observing how a person is going towards the point of suicide. And that's the, the difficult work in, in the work with people with a melancholic problem how to stop this huh? so but it, it's a fundamental to it is this question of a disorientation so it's not just a matter of speaking with people it's also a matter of finding a certain orientation 
And how do you find an orientation? It's by finding a certain limit and a certain direction about which to, to speak. Um, and so therefore it needs some kind of an act where the analyst is actively present, but in another way than, than what I described in the case of neurosis, where it's a kind of a reinstallment of, of, of the other and of a belief in that unconscious truth can be articulated. Here it will rather be that um, the, the point, the evolution towards decay um, and towards death um, is not the self-evident evolution. So the analyst will be there to find um, a sidetrack, a way out, out of that destructive process. And therefore, in the case that I discussed in my chapter, I kind of describe how I worked with, with, with that certain lady. And she was, the, 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 the analysis started with um, a testimony about uh, different passage acts mm -hmm. where she really confronted herself with the point of almost dying, uh, presenting these in, 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 in a real despair to me. And then uh, the work of the analysis consisted both of questioning what is it that drives you mad? What is it that triggers you? Huh? So I had to know as an analyst what it exactly was that was provoking it. And in her case, I observed that it had to do with motherhood. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, my conclusion was something needs to be done at that level. And then, of course, there is no clear technique for a Lacanian analyst as to how you, 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 what you should do as a construction or as a side way that it's not resulting into further despair and this point of suicide, because that's always the what, what is kind of waiting at the horizon in case of in cases of melancholia. So what, what could it be that that is this this way out? And so in her case, but that's it's always very particular. Um, it was by talking how she, how and when she she lost her trust and her kind of automatic way of doing as a mother um, and, and, and trying to find a new connection with the idea of being there as a mother in her, in her own family. And so it's then I'm, I'm there in thinking aloud and trying to invent some kind of a solution. Um, so I don't know, Leon, what, Leon, what you really had in mind by saying that it, my, my approach is may, may be different in, in the sense that I point to what we can do because often in the treatment of psychosis by Lacanians, it's it's a discussion about don't do this and don't do, don't do that. And so it, it remains the preliminary question, but I think we can really orient our work and that in melancholia, it's finding this side way compared to the road that goes towards decay and death, because that's exactly the position we expect in pure melancholia knowing of course that often it is mixed huh? so sometimes we have this paranoid traits combined with melancholic traits but the, the pure melancholic ten tendencies towards that I, I, I would say by an identification through the identification with the position of I am the waste product I'm not worth of being here amongst in relation to the other um, I don't have a place in the symbolic order mm -hmm. Can I just chip in a little bit there? I mean, I've I've been fortunate enough to hear Stain talk about the, the case in question, you know, and obviously we can't say much more here, but one of the links between what Stain's just said and what I was trying perhaps not very well to describe is that if we if we take seriously the, the idea of an identification with the dead, identification with indeed already being dead in a sense, and it's often intriguing if you, you know, if you dig around in those case histories about you know, was there a lost child? What what would identification with the dead mean? And what, what are the particular um, uh, circumstances in a given life that would give a certain life to that being dead? Mm -hmm. If we take that seriously, then we could argue that what one will see in the case of melancholia, and Stain, I think, described this very nicely, is, is, is death on the horizon or suicide on the horizon. And we will also find uh, a number of uh, very loud, often noticeable self-damaging acts. And of course, as clinicians, it's alarming because you know you you can see that, and it 
initially it may even sound neurotic, you know, like the self-punishing acts that Freud discusses. But these are, are, are moments when, when people will be doing things which are really putting their life in considerable danger at a number of times, okay? But then maybe one way of thinking about that, that how to work creatively in the clinic of melancholia, if we could put it in those terms, is to find a way where by this deathliness and this death drive quality might still be accommodated within life. Now, of course, I'm, I'm guessing, Leon, you're hearing there, maybe sublimation is something you're talking about. And I don't want to take us all the way to now thinking about Lacanian notions of the symptom. But what I am gesturing towards is, is, is staying talking about creative solutions as such. And at least in, in the background to some of what I was trying to describe in the chapter, one of the ch challenges of clinical work was to think about how one can support some creative work whereby within the life of someone who's melancholic, who might be on a trajectory towards suicide and who might have a lot of death drive within everyday life, what forms of living might be able to facilitate something of those death drive and, and, and deathly destinations within, the, in, within a creative way, within certain facets of their life, which might not end up with them physically killing themselves. Um, <clears throat> But I, th I think I have an illustration about that in my very case study in the chapter, mm -hmm. because there we have this lady, of course, with these suicidal tendencies, and she tells uh, in the sessions about the loss of, of, of a very good friend, the, the, the person she's uh, been most close with uh, in, in her life. Um, and then, of course, there is this deep suffering that goes with the story, but the, the solution that she found is uh, when she kind of makes a switch between what we, from a Freudian perspective, could call a secondary process, thinking about the death of the friend and she not having a future, towards some kind of a primary process uh, moment. And in her case, it was by taking things very literally. So, for example, she described how uh, at the funeral of her best friend, some things happens, happened, like them putting feathers on the, on, on the coffin. And then certainly she invents uh, an image for a tattoo. And then she starts designing a tattoo with a feather. And then she puts the tattoo with a feather on her body. And that's something that she did uh, connected to different anecdotes uh, during the clinical work, where at, so to speak, at the level of the metonymy, at the level of the metonymy of the continuity of thoughts, she can stop the metonymy, metonymy. She can stop thinking in this endless secondary process about the sense of life and how it is lost by the loss of the friend by making this very literal translation, primary process interpretation, so to speak, of this very content. And therefore she can stop thinking about the content. And so this kind of a solution, which of course, from a Lacanian perspective, we can indeed qualify as a symptomatic solution, or we could say that it's, um, that it's a certain way of treating the signifier um, by linking it to the real, and, and therefore the image obtains a different status. Uh, that's all true. Um, but the mechanism here at work in that case is the very mechanism that we see uh, often as a process of stabilization in the treatment of psychosis. Uh, it's finding a certain stability in the creative working with the primary process association. And so therefore it's with sounds, it's with, it's with decontextualized meanings, it's with rhyme, uh, it's with uh, similarities at the level of images um, that can stop, that can that that can work as a barrier that stops a certain way of thinking. And in melancholia, it's this kind of stop that we want because if we don't obtain that stop, we we know that the direction is uh, via this. Uh, it's 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 the pure uh, tendency towards that identification with object A with. I am the waste product because that's of course the deep conviction. Um, so how to stop this thinking about this this this, this identification? And that that's I think the mechanism here. And this Derek, I was wondering how does this comply with your formulation of uh, the of allowing the melancholic to formulate the multiple variants of the state of being dead? Hmm? 
is that not actually continuing the the articulation of of the the position of the object of 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 uh, refuge um uh, mm -hmm. yeah let me let me say something quickly about that because i i'm also thinking we threw out this concept of the symptom this lacanian concept without much way of explanation so let's mm. do a very basic thing and i will link i think very concretely nicely to some of the things that stain had said mm -hmm. starting with the idea we'll just use it illustratively that there is a that there is a radical identification with with being dead and let's say that we could imagine that within the case of melancholia we'll see multiple enactments of, of death multiple enactments of being dead and, and you know there's the most literal one the suicidal thing all of that but if we're properly lacanian about it we want to say two things one is that the clinician would presumably want to help support the work of a creative response to that and if we want to know what the symptom is with the different spelling in, in Lacanian um, uh, jargon, what we're talking about is something that is a creative solution to difficulties in life, which finds enables the subject to find something, a way of dealing with their jouissance, in other words, libidinal intensities, with being able to locate for themselves uh, a symbolic position, and also to be able to give themselves some kind of imaginary location in terms of an identity. So to keep it as simple as possible, one of the reasons I like the, the filmic uh, case study of Into the Wild is we see Christopher McCandless, and again, I'm not saying anything definitive diagnostically, just using it illustratively, you could argue that there we see an enactment of death, an enactment of death and a symptomatic response to an enactment of death at multiple registers. So number one, you've got someone who, at least provisionally for the cases of this argument, the illustrative thing, let's say that he is melancholic, okay? Maybe he's not really, but let's say he is melancholic. How do you enact deathliness in life? Well, one is you go off grid. You, you disconnect from a given social network and you go into the wild. And I mean, I, I love that phrase because into the wild really sounds like death drive. It's like, I'm leaving. So number one, you've got to find some way of dealing with how to get out of the pressures of a symbolic frame. And of course, he adopts this anonymous name, um, Alexander Supertramp. You know, he, he takes on a different name. So he he kind of defaults. He goes outside of the symbolic, which you could say is one way of enacting death, right? Because to not exist in the symbolic is to not exist in a way. Number two, you could say he also needs to find a way with jouissance. And I think this is often where things get a little bit challenging in, in working with, with melancholics, because that libidinal intensity is also something that one needs to find a way of working with. And the Lacanian notion of the symptom wants to also prioritize that. The symptomatic means of living a life, making sense of oneself, is also a way of finding a way with one's jouissance. So for Christopher McCandless, not only is he going to go into the wild and, um, and go off grid, but there is a degree of jouissance that's invested in that. And of course, he also has an identity. So you could say that that whole move of going into the wild is a way of allowing death drive to have some existence. It allows him to locate himself relative to the symbolic in this respect by trying to get out of it. And he also has a kind of identity of an adventurer and so on and so forth. Now, if we go back to other cases of melancholia, we could ask if there is a creative work within the life of the subject, does that enable them to in, uh, enact deathliness within life, but that has a certain stability at those three levels of how to find oneself in relationship to a social link, a symbolic order, uh, with jouissance and with something of the imaginary identity. And I'm not remembering all of Stain's case's details, but I think we are able to identify some of those. And just to say that last thing, Properly, the Kenyan work would need to be aware of all of those things, right? Because the subject isn't simply the subject of jouissance, just as they're not simply the subject of the imaginary or the subject of the symbolic. All of those things seem to be important. Yeah, but like in my case, this lady is now very tattooed. Um, she's like a living tomb. Hmm. She's the living tomb of her best friend who died. But hmm. the imagery that she's having on her body it's not such that other people would think immediately, oh, this is all referring to death, but it's referring to personal like memories, but they all have to do with death. So in, in, in that sense, it's she's kind of living the death of her best friend on her body. So on her own living skin, it is it, 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 it is there. Can I ask Steen, uh, are you familiar with Rick, Rick Luce on toxicomania? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. On the, the, the idea of the administration of the jouissance and the, and the death drive. Yeah. One thing he relates to, to you know, the needle of a drug addict is, is that even with the needle, there's a cultural inscription happening, right? So there's a commodity form that gives you a sense of pleasure. And it's, it's an inscription on the body. So the needle goes into the body. And the, the tattoo is many, many thousands of needles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's that there's a there's a symbolic inscription happening. Yeah. yeah. So so you have you have you have death drive. You have that which is kind of beyond the symbolic, but you also have an a cultural kind of inscription. Yeah, on, yeah, yeah. On, on the actual body. Yeah. Yeah, that's certainly true. But here we must see that in the way of it is in, the way it is inscribed into the body is not purely following the secondary process logic, but the primary process logic. So it's. That, that that's I, I guess key to to the whole process and that's what we need to support so the lacanian analyst shouldn't require it to be logical and comprehensible yeah. at all level it's it's a point of finding some kind of a of an absurd translation and taking that absurd translation as key and not questioning it as a bit weird and that's exactly what we will do of course in the treatment of neurosis we find it a bit weird if someone is having a dream and bringing the dream to a session, we ask a question about it because we don't take it for granted what the dream is saying. So it's a bit weird and we take it in its weirdness as a sign of the unconscious. And that's exactly what we shouldn't do in the case of psychosis. And then rather support the weirdness uh, in it because of course, it's a brutal pointing to the, to the experience of, of, of a whole, of nothing, of having no ground, of the groundlessness of existence. So it, it, it wouldn't make sense to question it because, and that's also been described by many Lacanian analysts, if we question the groundlessness and keep on focusing on that, we only um, strengthen the despair of, the, of, of someone suffering from melancholia. Do, and do you think that something in your relationship which allowed that space where she could repeat some kind of stuff that was going on for her in relationship to death. So that, that, that first, first it was you think it was a ground paved so that the tattoo could happen. Yeah. So, but I must say, of course, that the, that she's starting to tattoo her tattooing her body came as a complete surprise to me because yeah. she looked her looks were very conventional. Uh, the way she dressed, mm -hmm. the way her hair was it was very conventional mm -hmm. and at the same time she was having these big tattoos on her body or started speaking about the big tattoo so i was surprised but um as i describe in 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 the case i think also key to understanding how the transference was established is that in that treatment i immediately positioned myself as the one who was to be regulated by her so instead of imposing my analytic frame too strongly to her Mm -hmm. um, I let myself regulate by her, and I, I describe a couple of things uh, in, in in my case discussion. For but for example, when normally when I let people in into my office, I open the door and I close the door, and uh, that lady asked me if is it okay that you enter your office first and I will close the door because I can't stand if someone is really literally behind my back. Mm. And then I said, okay, that's fine for me. I find it a bit peculiar because it's out of my uh, little ritual of what I usually do as an analyst. But I think that for her, it was important. And, and so this is kind of how to, how to have this different position. Um, and that in, in, in conceptually speaking, such a little intervention, such a little act that is actually addressing the analyst and not so much the, the analysant is, is there to make sure that the analyst is castrated, that I am marked by a certain kind of lack, by a lack of jouissance. Uh, and that's what in, in psychosis needs to be established because there can only grow faith into the figure of the analyst and the actions of the analyst if it's clear that the analyst is actually a loser. <laughs> Huh? So you have to be marked by a certain lack. It's yeah. not because of your intelligence. It's not about your fluency. It's not about your beautiful rituals in your practice. It's about not having something. And she probably observed 
how I was a little bit disoriented by her question uh, and a little bit embarrassed by my saying, okay. And it's probably this little observation of embarrassment at my level that makes sure to an analyzant like, like hers that I am marked by actually by a lack. And I'm not fully regulated by symbolic order at that very point. Mm -hmm. and these are the little things that an, enable a transference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also um, what I think is important in that case um, because I don't know if Leon was pointing to that. I let that lady talk about her suffering to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, and 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 why why would I do that? Of course, there is a little danger to that. There is a risk of someone entering that domain of so such a deep sorrow that she can't leave it anymore, and therefore that it's a way towards suicide. But at the same time, there is no option by purely saying you don't, you can't speak about it because that's exactly what happens in the current mental health care system, the dominant mental health care system, where people are expected to take a pill and to stop thinking and speaking about it. Um, yes. So as an analyst, we have to find an opening via the words, but at the same time, we have to find a limit at the level of words. And that's very challenging. And it's very difficult as for you as an analyst, but I think... It's at that level that we are working. And that's, yeah, where we have to look for a solution always and again, also at the case level. Okay, so Constantine, hello, nice to see you. Hmm? Hi, yeah, nice to see you as well. Um, to Stin's um, saying like the last five minutes, I think one uh, interesting question is what gives the ground of existence? So that we can work with it and and I mean, um, Mr. Hook was talking about the symptom as well as a creative solution uh, of yeah, handling uh, difficulties in life. So what gives the ground of existence? Yeah, yeah, of course. But from Lacanian perspective, there is no ground. And that's the whole clue of Lacan's later teaching when he's saying a thing like, il n'y a pas de rapport sexuel. Uh, so there is no sexual uh, rapport. Uh, uh, la femme n'existe pas. Uh, the uh, women does not exist. That's all pointing to the fact that there is a fundamental hole for which there is no solution. And the analyst, so to speak, from a Lacanian perspective, is someone who went to that very conclusion through his own analysis, her own analysis, and 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 didn't die. Uh, and 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 found a way of continually living and found find found some personal solution to that. And that personal solution is the Santom. But we know that the Santom, of course, it's nothing. It's a little thing that that you, a little a little invention, a little procedure that makes you live. But of course, it may, doesn't make real sense in the sense that that you found the the true the true uh, sense of existence. It isn't there. And the Lacanian analysis for the analyst is also the observing of that, but also the point of. But that doesn't. That, that doesn't prevent you for, from continuing living. And of, that's why, in my view also, uh, the Lacanian analyst is very well suited to work with melancholia because we know there is no ground for living. So they don't have to convince us, we know. The, the, the question is how to find a way out. Uh, and that's also what we, of course, you can only help someone if you felt it deeply yourself and, and found one solution for yourself and and then, of course, it's it, it's up to the other to to find a, full, a solution for him or herself. But but we know that it, there is a certain possibility. Um, maybe just to to add to that, it's a great it's a great answer. I suppose what you could also do is approach that that answer in terms of the difference between the structural difference between neurosis and psychosis. So you could say, if the Lacanian position is to say there is no ground, actually. Um, one, and this helps us to also say a little bit about foreclosure, which we'd mentioned earlier on and haven't really properly returned to. What does it mean to say there is no ground for the neurotic? And what does it mean to say there is no ground for the psychotic? Well, for neither, there is a, a kind of existing ground, but you could say, to use some of the Lacanian terminology, if there is something like the name of the father, in other words, if there is a fundamental rooting or installation of laws and uh, social norms and values within the life of the neurotic, 
one way of dealing with the fact that there is no ground is at least that you've got that okay you've got the you've got these laws you've got this name you've got this location within the symbolic domain and another way of putting that is to say you have a certain facility with the the processes and um the means of language and that enables a whole series of defensive moves it enables repression it enables all of those kinds of things so you don't have ground but what you do have is a certain facility with repressive dynamics with um the unconscious structure like a language right so you've got something but that then casts a comparative framework dimension to what you've got in neurosis i mean in psychosis when if you do not have that installation then you confront there not being a ground in in arguably a far more radical way and I suppose that's also where we have in 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 later Lacan the the emphasis on the importance of of invention uh, within the life of psychosis. So whereas if you neurotic, you can take for granted as it were a certain installation of values of of linguistic processes and so on and so forth that roots you and grounds you in the symbolic domain. In the case of psychosis, you cannot make that assumption. And what that's, there needs to happen is a lot more uh, creative work to locate oneself in relationship to those three dimensions I spoke of earlier, right? How to locate oneself relative to jouissance, how to locate oneself relative to the social order, a social link, and how to locate oneself relative to a kind of what we would call in everyday psychological language, a personal identity. Those, in a sense, need to be invented. And here also important, uh, I think, is to, to see that in, in Lacan's teaching, he kind of makes the evolution that the solution for the neurotic is um, is finding a way next to the name of the father. So it's a way out of convention. Um, and the, the, the starting point of, of psychosis is having this position out of convention and finding a, a way of living, although there is no convention. So therefore, also in Lacan's teaching, what we see is that the, 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 the longer he teaches about psychoanalysis, the more there is a similarity between the, the basic problem of neurosis and psychosis. Mm -hmm. uh, well, plus at first it's like two distinct psychiatric problems, then it's a different structure, but then later on it's 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 a it's a variation in the knot. And that's a, that that's absolutely an evolution in, in the teaching. I think um, Lacan made the commentary about psychoanalysts that know the ground for existence, that uh, that have trained enough to know what what are the grounds for existence. And I think he suggests he says, well, they tell the, the depressed patient, go to the Eiffel Tower, look at the beautiful view, see beautiful Paris. And then Lacan is saying, well, commonly what happens is that they jump from the the Eiffel. <laughs> And I think that what, what Stain, what you're saying is so important that one can see a Lacanian analyst without being worried that they will drive them to this kind of suicide. I mean, because the, the 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 analyst then does not does not know and on, or actually knows too well that there is no ground, and the question is not to find it somewhere outside on the Eiffel Tower, but again, as as you both were saying, through a unique a unique way a unique way out. <clears throat> How about some more questions or we can wrap things up? Mm. I'll just mention, I think, something important that this book is so outstanding and the fact there's so many perspectives on, on depression, on melancholia. And I think it will, it will provide a lot of work for future scholars and practitioners that could combine them and rethink them uh, one next to the other. And I think having Stain and, and Derek here together side by side was fantastic and, and a demonstration of mm. how such a thing can happen. Um, I've got, I've got, I've got one, one last question, but I don't know whether I should really go there or not. But, but it's just, it's just about this idea that we have a, a general kind of a withdrawal of the efficacy of the name of the father as, a, as the social relation is kind of evolving. So I, I was, I was, you know, that, that's it's a massive question. Maybe it's, we don't have the time to think about that in relationship to, uh, to melancholy and and depression whether we're seeing more more of the question has an stuff. excellent answer to your question and uh, yeah. uh, it really does go for it Stan. yeah well uh, of course there is a link um uh, and 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 the link is um uh, capitalism um yeah. i think the, the the discourse of capitalism there we see the both the belief that there is a solution possible for discontent and it will not be 
a solution that is reached through speech. It will be through a gift, the gift of a bill, the gift of an answer. Uh, and we're living in a culture right now that is supporting that idea. Um, and it's, it's especially also, of course, the observation by specific individuals that this is not working, that is confronting them with this this both this observation of the deep discontent they, that they experience but it's a discontent that is at the same time connected to uh, a lack of belief in the other so there is this deception as, as i told you i think that, that this dynamic that you're pointing to is especially true for neurotic depression i don't think that the, the psychotic melancholia of course it, the, the, the way it is colored is, is strongly connected to it but i, I, I wouldn't see really like the causal link of 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 the of the, of, of the psychotic uh, version of, of the melancholia, but uh, if, really if, connected to that. If if we think of older traditional patriarchal etc. structures that used to give the subject a place that, that they could hold a place, that the subject could have a place, that they're not holding so much anymore. So. That's certainly true, and that's of course the thing that the the amount of freedom. Uh, increased, but the amount of not knowing also increased. Uh, in, in, a, in a strange way, it, it's, there's, a, there's a kickback happening, isn't it? Where people then identify with the pathology as a disorder. So, 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 so more and more people like are actually identifying with, a, with a, a, you know, with one of the DSM categories. That's, mm -hmm. that's how they find their way into the symbolic, actually, as a, as a holding space. But uh, uh, obviously, there's a lot of dangers that come along with that. But I, I just, just, it's just something that yeah. I, I kind of noticed that it's, it's, it's an extra problematic one when, when you don't have that holding space. And suddenly you have these offerings up of identity through <laughs> categorizations of disorders. Yeah? Mm -hmm. but again, it's, it's, the, it's, it's where the object for Lacan is, is something different than the object. It's not a biological object. It's not a. <laughs> It's not a cultural object, yeah? which which we could think about in terms of like disorders yeah? and classifications as a cultural object, yeah? something that you can identify with. So I think basically for Lacan, there's two ideas of his his, his invention of the object R, petty object R, object petty R, but but then also of substance, which is not substance like a neurochemical. Or it's not one of the humors that you know that Hamlet suffered from in Shakespeare, but it, 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 it's it's an object of another invention. So with invention, and, and then I, I was thinking about because Derek, you spoke in one of your lectures about jouissance, about substance, yeah. So about jouissance, what does Lacan say about object A? It's his only invention, and that substance is you no know, jouissance is the only substance. So I was I was thinking about that in, in relationship to like object uh, and what you described, Steen, in relationship to, you know, first of all, there's the waste, identifying as waste, and there is no hope. The, the other cannot rescue you. So that, that there's no dialectic there. Yeah? But it's somehow nonetheless, through this other side of object petty uh, it can go into a creative side. Where, where, where a new operation happens and a, and a new... Maybe, maybe we can then... It's a good idea to schedule another talk maybe and uh, delve into these very interesting questions, but I think uh, Stain and Derek have gave, gave us their time and sure, yeah. promise to, to finish uh, at this point. Augusto and Constantine, sorry, but... You can definitely contact us. That's not we're not so they're not so scary people. I promise you. I want to thank you, Derek and Stain, uh, for your time, and um, would suggest everyone here to pick up a copy on the book. And we'll see each other very soon in in another talk.